Hello, listener. We speak to you from Sunday, the 18th of February, a day that has just witnessed Man United surviving for a 2-1 win at Kenilworth Road and Brighton having themselves a big win at Bramall Lane. Witness to that and so much more. Tim Spears. Hello, Tim. Hi, James. Uh, JJ Bull is also with us. Hello. Reuniting the top team from the previous show last Friday. That's right, yes. Woof. Daniel Stories on the big screen. All right, Daniel. Good evening, James. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good. Thank you. So, Tim, you nailed the Arsenal score on the preview show. I, I did I? I, I, I Five so, nil, yeah. you said. Yeah, yeah, Were there yeah. any other spectacularly accurate or inaccurate pr- predictions on that? Uh, I think I went two-two for Luton Man United, which was, yeah, which which was you, nearly so. To be fair, it should have been. Should have been. Ross yeah. Barkley hit the bar and stop his time. Mm. It's nearly right there. Uh, yeah, I've started thinking about. Uh, football a bit more and it's yielding oh, yeah. fruit in, in form of predictions I look forward to pretty today. useless but you know we'll, we'll give it a go if Excellent. only your job somehow informed <laughs> that, that would be useful <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, what happened this weekend listener well Man City went and dropped points in another draw with Chelsea Arsenal picked some up and, and got themselves another massive win at Burnley Liverpool won at Brentford but picked up injuries Villa moved back into the top four at Spurs expense after Wolves beat Spurs and Villa won at Fulham uh, the West Ham wobble worsened. They were beaten 2 0 at Nottingham Forest. And, well, other things as well. What do, what do we learn from match day 26? Five. Five? What do we learn from match day 25, Daniel? What was your big takeaway? Uh, I mean, I think the, the kind of spectacular element was, was Burnley and Sheffield United fine of kind of su- succumbing to their own uh, incompetence. Uh, I know Sheffield United won away last weekend and Luton are an impossible team to judge having watched both of those last two games. Um, But the way that both sides sort of completely collapsed, ill discipline, absolutely no purpose or fight. Managers just sort of looking on from the touchlines of to say, this is everything I feared days, weeks, months ago. Uh, I think we finally have at least have our two confirmed relegation teams. Mm. Seeing a lot of nodding around the studio over that. Anything you'd like to add, JJ or Tim? Well, I, I'm completely biased, but I particularly enjoyed Wolves winning away at Spurs. Nice, on, nice. On on Saturday. Okay. Uh, beautifully done. Yeah, but it's you know tough week for Wolves losing Cunha, their mm. their star player for the last few weeks, and up steps Pedro Neto and Joe Gomez. Do you want to talk about that goal? Uh, yeah, undoubtedly my favourite of the weekend. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, th- these are the two teams I sort of followed closest of all, certainly this season, being as a Wolves fan and, 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 re- and reporting on Spurs. Mm. And I just, I just kind of knew that that's how it would play out, really, because Spurs play the same way every single week, and they leave gaps on the counter, and that's Pedro Neto's favourite thing to do. He just, he, his, his desire on the counter attack is wonderful. And he just sprints seventy yards, but then he doesn't just put the ball in the box. You know, he stops. He uses other foot, he picks out Gomez, and it's a beautiful finish. And yeah, Wolves are in the European hunt. Woof. I'm, ex- I'm excited. Wolves are sexy. <laughs> That's <laughs> such no a turnaround one, for me. Ever. No, but no, previously, but then, you know, Gary O'Neill. Mm. Yeah, it's been, quite, it's been an unbelievable Giving turnaround. Giving it the Tim Henman afterwards. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, less said about that, the better. But yeah, I saw people yesterday saying, uh, Postacoglu, you know, he's still working it out. It's his first season. Mm. Oh, yeah, Gary O'Neill took over. Four days before the start of the season. None of the players are his. And yeah, look what they're doing. Look what they're doing. Was that the goal of the weekend? That that Neto run? Or, or what you got? Well, I like the one that Abouni scored for um, Nottingham Forest. Taking it on the first touch on the turn with players right next to him all around him and then finishing. I think that was the hardest one to do. Mm. I like Daniel, it. What, how come they haven't mentioned Darwin Nunes yet? Yeah, I love that. I love the clock reaction of to say, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Thank you for doing that. That was amazing. Um, it was, yeah, it was a beautiful finish. Uh, and you watched Alejandro Garnaccio go through on goal in pretty much exactly the same way um, for Manchester United. And it kind of made you realise that, yeah, it's not as simple as just scooping it over the goalkeeper. It's, it's, it's actually quite a difficult skill. It was, it was incredibly Darwin Nunes. Uh, that was my favourite goal of the weekend for the assist. Uh, as well as the finish Mm. that shot a header like I I know everybody was talking about it so uh, but just the presence of mind to run forward onto the ball and then still sort of skew it sideways with your head Uh, it looked it looked so much better on the slow motion replay because at first it just looked quite a weird header as if he'd sort of almost like sort of overrun the ball and was just leaning back but it's it's a piece of absolute brilliance Mm. and the trajectory calculation while running at speed of Nunes 
Just incredible. All right. Uh, well, lots to look forward to then in today's show. We'll also be catching up on the latest from Crystal Palace ahead of their Monday night clash with Everton. But Sunday's games, first of all, is there much to say about uh, Sheffield United and Brighton, apart from the fact that it was a much-needed win for Brighton and Daniel kind of handled the total meltdown for the Blades? Do you want to just move straight on to Kenilworth throw No, Tim, you're... Well, I, this hmm. was one of the most remarkable uh, yellow cards initially given that you'll see oh. all season. That's my favourite VAR still, definitely the season, where uh, it pauses on Holgate, horizontal... Uh, trying to cut Mitoma in half. Reminded me of a Kevin Muscat tackle from a few years ago for Australia. Um, yeah, and unbelievably, the ref gives a yellow. I mean, to be fair to him, there's a Sheffield United player slightly obscuring his view, but it's um, it's the most blatant red card you'll see in the season. In the old, on, on FIFA 98, the old uh, video game, there was a button you could push when you put in the PC, I think it was Q, and it was like a f deliberate foul tackle. It was very, very funny, and I used to enjoy using it because you knew you would get sent off when you did it because he would lunge <laughs> in like that. But the, he's basically pushed Q, and then uh, you'll see his reaction was though he had not done anything wrong, which is kind of mean to the referee. So he's he's gaslighting them because he knows what he's done. But it's astonishing that you try and get away with that, mm. knowing that you're also being watched by cameras. Yeah, it gets better after the game. Anil uh, Amahodzic, the Sheffield United central defender, um, was interviewed about it and said he couldn't believe it was a red card. It's not the sort of challenge you want to see him being given a red card. Which, fair play, they're all kind of keeping up that act of absolute farce. It's the worst tackle I've seen this season. Yeah. Very good. Anyway, uh, Brighton, Mitoma thankfully surviving that and Brighton running out 5-0 winners away at Bramall Lane. Later that afternoon then we had Luton's Man United clash, which saw United roaring out of the blocks with uh, Hoyland picking up two early goals, the second of which was quite a remarkable bit of skill. Was it, or did he, it, it, did it just bounce off him? What was your... Oh, the second? shoulder, when he turns it in. Yeah, when he kind of... He, he definitely, I, I don't, he's not aiming particularly for that exact bit of the goal, but he's definitely right. just reacting knowing that the ball's at him, so the, the right thing to do is shift his body to put it in. Okay. It's, it's, it's odd, because it looks like um, he's just reacting because the ball's coming to him, so he's mm. just trying to get out of the way of it, but I think it's on purpose. Okay. It has to be. I think we should give them the benefit oh, of the Oh, for doubt. sure. So Luton were two goals down early, and then what happened? And then Man United started playing, well, not playing, I suppose. Mm. They have this incredible ability to let football happen to them in a way they can't control. Sort of summed up, I think, by Bruno Fernandes with about 45 minutes of stoppage time left in the game, having the ball out wide. They've just taken a short corner to slow down time, and then Fernando shoots and 25 yards straight at the goalkeeper and Luton go down the other end and get a last second corner. They're just an astonishingly bad team at controlling matches. The one player who is better than all the others at it is Kobe Mainu, which is kind of damning in itself. And he's this young kid that's just coming to the team. But there were times in the first half when he was sort of looking around as if to say, why are we trying to play this at double speed? Why are we trying to rush everything? We're, we're quite good at football and we've got a lead. We, all we need to do is just pass the ball and play out the game and pull Luton out of space and look in behind, which eventually happened naturally second half and, and then they missed those chances. But Luton, really unfortunate not to get a point. Mm. I've been thinking this about Man United recently. They, you know, for a long time, people have been saying they don't know what Ten Hag's trying to do and they don't know what the system is or the clear style of play. I think... Weirdly, and I might be wrong with this, but I think that what you see in this Luton game is kind of what he wants. He doesn't want control. Like when we think of Man United, we think they should be in control of games because that's what good teams do. But they're trying to constantly push it forwards and chase up and make it very chaotic so they can try and revel in that. And I was thinking that the way they were playing against Luton, like they're playing against Luton in the final 15 minutes and they're sat in a really like tight, deep block to then try and break on the counter with these good players. Now, when Atletico Madrid do that in Spain or the Champions League or something... You think, well, that's how they play. It's tenacious and it's very impressive with the way they manage to defend. They don't concede any goals. United didn't concede late on. They got three points out of it, so it worked. And they hit people on the counter with really good players. So at the end there, you had Fernandes, Fernandes, um, Garnacho, Rashford, all charging forward on the counter-attack, having blocked them from being able to score. It doesn't seem like what Man United should do. But I think Ten Hag is trying to make his team play in this way where it's always going forward and always direct and... Not what you think of Man United, because it looks like what a bad team would do rather than mm. what a good one is. But I think that might be what he's trying to do. Does that sound st stupid? I, I don't know. <laughs> I've got to understand it, first of all. and then uh, So he's trying to make them play like a bad team. I think they're trying to be very direct. So they're not trying to... Like, they've got players like um, uh, Menu who can, like mm. Daniel saying, who can keep the ball and pass it around. Right. 
But what they, like Fernandes, the things he's best at is pinging the ball forward into space. Mm. So you've got that option. You've got runners like Garnacho and Rashford who need to run into space really to be useful. So if you can manufacture situations where you are sat back and can recoil like a spring and then dart over the top, right. you're going to have more space to attack. Right. And so teams like Luton, might, you might assume in the past, would not be able to do that to Man United because they don't allow you to do it because they right. have control of the games. But if you manufacture those situations, you can create space. But Okay, so essentially they play on the break. They, they sit deep and, and play on the break. But it wasn't the thing with Ten Hag coming in from Ajax, we thought he was going to be Dutch football thing. Yeah, and what Jay's is saying is fine if the execution is good, but you had a yeah. situation where uh, uh, Fernandez or... Fernandez. <laughs> ...rans the keeper 2-1 uh, up and then shot blocked. You had the, the ludicrous one with Garnacho. He also ran to the keeper, messed that up. Uh, you had McTominay one and one he missed it. So they're wasting all these glorious chances. And then you also have a situation where Luton have... 57% possession today. Yeah, That's their third highest of the season. The two high ones being against Burnley and Sheffield United, who, as Daniel says, are barely even Premier League teams anymore. So it doesn't look great, and it's not it's not refined whatsoever, and it's not what but we expect. Man United. Works, but, though, yeah. yeah, they've won like the last, what, five games in a row? Or four, yeah. five out of the last six? Four, four in a row. Um, and out of nowhere, they're back in the Champions League. Right? And, and, so and no at half-time, there was changes as well, right? And like, one of the first things, other than the substitutions they made, one of the first things I noticed they started doing was Onana was playing long from the mm. back. They're not trying to play through the press. They're just trying to get it long, win the second ball, push forward, because that's where the gaps are. So you give Luton, Luton more of the ball. They attack you, always down the right, hooking the ball in. You've got big lads there, head it away. You break. The strategy makes sense, but it just seems... It kind of sucks if you support Man United because you want them to be in control of the game and create like all the good teams do. Yeah, and then you've got Luton trying to play it through midfield, through Ross Barkley. This yeah. uh, put out a bit of a magician's, but probably the best midfielder on the pitch today. So it's sort of roles reversed and it's Luton v Man United and the graphic they put up before kickoff, you know, in terms of budget, history, mm. uh, ground capacity, you know, it's just, it's like, it's like a, an FA Cup tie this is. And yet you've got at times Luton playing the nicer football really and progressing it nicely through Barkley and Townsend and then United going direct on the counter attack at Kenworth Road. If that is the plan, it's not really sustainable. That's kind of the... The thing, I don't think you can... I mean, lots, most managers try and reduce risk and reduce right. the, the chance of chaos and dice rolls, but it's almost like he's encouraging that because that makes them... Like, Ten Hag has said that um, wherever he said it when he first came in is different to what he's saying now, I think, because he's saying he wants to be the best uh, team in, or best transitional team in the, the world or something like that. Mm. But it's about being in transition, so he's trying to create moments where they can get forward quickly and exploit space to use the pace that they have. The team's strengths are... Uh, Bruno Fernandes uh, knocking these long passes into space or just forward and then chasing that up and that seems to be what they're best at and so then in the second half they've got McTominay on so they can hit long balls from Onana who's very good at that and then you can chase it up and it's playing to his strengths because it's not they don't have strengths uh, in passing through lines and building up in a controlled manner, really. And, and because they're so flawed, they're so entertaining to watch at the moment. Yeah. You, you knew it was going to be a good game today because Luton and Man United are both involved in entertaining games lately. And United's last six games, there have been 26 goals mm. in total for the two teams. And no wonder Harry Styles looked though, so enthralled. Harry Styles. And David Pleat, of course. Yeah. yeah. Producer Ben, who's standing in today for producer Charlie, observing that uh, he wasn't the only man with a kind of one direction philosophy, you know, because of what you're saying about yeah. hooping it up from Onana. <laughs> Just to give a little bit of an explanation there. We all thought it was hilarious. Uh, did you enjoy the game? I absolutely loved the game, yeah. I agree with, with Tim that it, it, it before kickoff, you knew it was going to be a kind of mad match. And I, I kind of feared after seven or eight minutes, or however long it was when United took a two-goal lead, I kind of thought, oh, that's the game dead. And then the first chance Luton got their score, I thought, yes, that's the Manchester United. We know it's going to be a good game. It's going to be fine. They're going to get all their senior players sent off. I thought Casemiro should have probably gone. Um, but yeah, they're just impossible. It's a, it's a roller dice team and they have won a few games in a row. But could you say with any confidence that in 12 months time, they will have a better plan to make this sustainable and to be second or third in the league? No, not for me. So mm. that's maddening given how, how much money's been spent and how long he's had to do it. Well, 12 months time, they could be very different with a different sporting director and all that kind of thing. Anyway, that's enough on Man United because I quite want to find out what happened to Manchester City this weekend and dropping points against Chelsea. Saturday evening, Manchester City, who most pundits assured us would be in full Death Star mode by now, barely dropping a corner, let alone a point went and dropped two of them 
in their 1-1 draw with Chelsea. Mind you, Chelsea also dropped two points because they were actually ahead in this game. A draw once more, but very different to the one that we witnessed back in November. Daniel? Yeah, absolutely. I, I kind of thought the game ended up being a tale of, of two strikers missing chances. Nicholas Jackson missing a chance to kill off the game. And Erling Haaland kind of maddeningly off form. Guardiola was quite funny after the game saying, look, I scored, I scored 11 goals in 11 years in my career, so I'm probably not going to offer advice to Haaland on how to finish. But it has become a little bit of a theme of this season. Um, this is kind of the ultimate whisper it quietly. But Haaland last season was was massively overachieving his expected goals. I think he was like plus 7.6. Him and Harry Kane way ahead of the rest, which you'd expect because they're the best finishers. Um, but he's got the worst XG to goals record this season of any Manchester City player. He's on minus 2.2. Wow. About 1.7 of those were on Saturday because he just missed so many chances. And normally when that happens, you're always back him to get another one and score it, which is kind of what happened the other week against Everton. But it just didn't happen for Haaland. And that is a weird one this season. City are being kind of carried by Phil Foden and Bernardo Silva scoring these low value chances. I think it's something mad like Haaland's had 70-odd shots with a, an XG of 18 and Foden's had 60-odd shots with an XG of about five because they are taking their chances from really, really difficult chances and Haaland's missing easy ones at the moment. It will obviously come good. He'll probably score four against Brentford this midweek. He'll probably score three next weekend. But it was the reason that Manchester City didn't win the game on Saturday and it was the reason they're not still in that Death Star mode. They're not still motoring on. OK. Haaland, who had 10 shots without scoring, which is... A the highest he's ever had without finding the net. So it was Haaland missing rather than the fact that there were players missing Bernardo Silva, uh, John Stones, who was not there at the back. Is Watching this, I was just wondering, are City less good at coping with absences than, say, Liverpool have been? I don't know about that. I think, I mean, they've had, they missed De Bruyne for half the season. Mm. Um, well, when Rodri wasn't there, they famously stuffed up those matches. Yeah. This game, they didn't seem to have quite the same. Uh, level of uh, yeah, I think they don't. Dominance. They haven't had the depth. The players they brought in, I, I don't know if they're not trusted or they just don't. They don't do exactly what Guardiola wants. Kovacic and, and Matias Nunes, I'm thinking of particularly, uh, going for more Portuguese pronunciation. Mm. John McKenzie makes me do that. Uh, and so I think that's maybe what it is. I don't know. Like I think Chelsea focus particularly on um, City's right side. So the goals, all their chances were coming down that well Chelsea's right. Um, and I'm trying to work out why that was. It's because they had Cole Palmer dropping into like a deeper position from a starting point. Because City are playing a, a well, it's essentially a back three, but it's very wide, very split. Because Zakanji is not really a centre back; he's playing in midfield. But they're building these um, attacks down the right hand side, maybe because they think Doku is the least, uh, well, the least best at, at pressing a part of the pressing structure. It's the only thing I can think of is where Pochettino found one little. The exhaust and the Death Star. Yeah. <laughs> That's where he found Possibly. it. Yeah. Although, it, who was um, who was Raheem Sterling up against when he scored that lovely goal? It was Kyle Walker. It was Kyle Walker. Yeah, okay. and he cut inside. So, in that case, it was Kyle Walker. And the, the, the pair re renewing their duel from Stamford Bridge back in November. And then later on, there was that lovely moment when Kyle Walker appealed for the penalty. Didn't get it and perf performed a quite remarkable sort of head jump thing. Did you see that where he bounced up in the air on his head? Yeah, and then yeah, he sort of just flailed his head around. He flexed he? off his neck. I mean, it was. It looked like a sort of you've been framed video played backwards, <laughs> where someone sort of falls into a paddling pool, but it played backwards. It was great. It's mm. almost like when you when you catch a fish and then you let go of it and then it bounces around. He looked like a flailing fish. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Hey, what about Chelsea then? Because they were ahead. Was it that they? ran out of steam was it the fact that Potts took off Cole Palmer and made those kind of changes I mean they looked exhausted towards the end they put in a huge effort in this game I was seriously impressed with them you, you know they're the first team to deny to, to deny Man City uh, in both games this season which you you know you would not expect and Chelsea have wilted time and again in the last mm. few weeks they do not cope well under pressure I don't know what's happened to them since they hit, hit rock bottom against Wolves a couple of weeks ago and, and were booed off and you know, negative chance from the stands. Um, something's clearly changed because they've gone on a good run since then. They had their best performance of the season against Villa. And yeah, they, they asked, it was a bit smash and grab sort of second half trying to hit them on the break, but they asked some serious questions of City, particularly in the first half. Some of their football, 
as Joe just said, Palmer coming deep to orchestrate play. I thought Gallagher was getting in some great positions. You know, lovely sort of reverse passes, him and Jackson and Palmer combining, like playing some really nice football. I'm like, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen too much of Chelsea recently, but they look, they look transformed to me. Very nice. There is that issue with the end of games, though. Producer Ben pointing out that only Sheffield United and Crystal Palace can see more goals in the last 15 minutes of games than Pochettino's side. Hmm. Well, the 1-1 draw means that City now lie two points behind Arsenal with, of course, a game in hand. Arsenal, who obliterated Burnley 5-0 at Turf Moor. City four points behind Liverpool, who they meet on March the 10th. Before that, they've got Brentford on Tuesday, who on Saturday, the Bees were 4-1 losers at home to Liverpool. With that Nunes chip, or was it a lob? What would you call it, Daniel? Uh, scoop, maybe. Scoop. Scoop. Yeah. There was also McAllister's goal, which JJ was a big fan of. Yeah, the lovely. First, I like first touches. That's one of my favourite things. Nice. Yeah. Gakpo. Yeah, a sort of, a sort of Burt Camp-esque with the, with the sort of two directions he took with it. Mm. Very nice. Yeah. All was, right. Uh, yeah. Gakpo's goal. Remind me, how was that? Gakpo's goal. Uh, it was sort of, it was sort of played across the box, and then a tidy, tidy low finish. So he's the fourth Liverpool player to score ten goals this season already. Ooh. Which is the first time that's happened to them since Dal Dalglish's era. I can't remember the year exactly, um, but it shows you how well that you know they coped with Salah with that. And now when Salah was out, and now they have to cope with potentially certainly Jota out for a little bit by the looks yeah. of it, and potentially Nunes as well. Okay, but Salah is back and banging. He is, yeah. I mean, he 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 has this remarkable ability to kind of naught to sixty in about three seconds, where he just comes back and immediately it's like he's never been away. Um, just the strength and depth of that team, you know, no, no Alisson and Trent Alexander, Alexander Arnold and Shopsley at the start, no Salah from the start, three players going off injured and you still end up with a forward line of Gakpo, Diaz and Salah and Harvey Elliott barely has to come off the bench. It's, a, it's extraordinary that strength and depth. What I liked is the way that when all those injuries happen, they can sometimes really clog up a team, but it seemed instantly that everyone knew what to do. So, right, McAllister says, Jones has gone off, so I'm going to be the one driving forward and making those runs. And Salah's come on now, so we're going to start filtering everything through to him rather than down the left. And yeah, they looked really good. And they were playing a Brentford team, we should say, who are absolutely wretched defending at home. There's only, only Burnley and Sheffield United have conceded more home goals than Brentford this season, which is kind of not what we expect from a Thomas Frank team. And I sort of, for the score I kind of looked into why that might be and I think it's basically just injuries they've they've had in 24 league games this season they played with 19 different combinations of defenders and goalkeeper which is basically unheard of they just keep picking up these injuries they keep having to change things they're playing Christopher Ayer as a full back in this game which is not his natural position they go between a three and a two to try and you know cover for those injuries and look they're not in any problems Brentford but for them to have the third worth defence in the Premier League at home is is a really odd thing. Mm. They're six points clear of the drop. The uh, injuries that Liverpool picked up, Jota's the serious one. How serious? Do we have any indication yet about how long he's likely to be out for? I think the reason it books bad is almost like kind of reverse psychology in that if they, I don't know, he, he just sort of was still for a long time and then looked really sad and then obviously he tried to walk off the pitch and then said I, I can't walk off the pitch I'm going to need a stretcher uh he looked pretty broken by the whole thing um Darwin Nunes we think was probably more precautionary Curtis Jones just felt something so that's normally a couple of weeks maybe but Jota did look a bit serious um it is the position he's been great form but it's the position they've got the most cover in with as I say with Gakpo and Elliot and Salah back and Diaz and Nunes and there's just so many options for them there. Well, Liverpool and the City, <clears throat> Man City swap opponents next because I mentioned City will be taking on Brentford on Tuesday while Liverpool host Luton on Wednesday night ahead of the League Cup final with Chelsea next Sunday. Luton actually on Wednesday will be Liverpool's last Premier League fixture until March. It's going to be interesting to see how that factors into the whole race at the top of the Premier League with other teams potentially racing past them and them having games in hand. And that kind of thing. Yeah, they've got Carabao Cup final next Sunday. The weekend after that is the FA Cup fifth round tie against Southampton. Arsenal, though. Arsenal, who are right there on their heels. Two points back in second place. 5-0 winners away at Turf Moor. Uh, the Gunners were 
having a sticky time over the festive period. And some people, Daniel, uh, didn't take their win over Liverpool a fortnight back too seriously. And it seems like they took that personally. Yeah, they really did. Um, I mean, they, they have been brilliant all season at beating the weaker teams. They've played 11 games against teams currently 13th or lower. They've won them all and scored at a rate of three a game. They, that's what they do. They, they blast everyone else and they hope that results against the biggest clubs in the league won't matter so much, um, although they've been pretty good in those as well. Mm. Um, I just think in games like this, when Erdegaard has space, basically opponents are left with nothing to do to stop it. You've either got Erdegaard in midfield with so much time on the ball playing passes because you're trying to cover Saka and Martinelli, or you double up on Erdegaard and create space out wide. And poor Burnley. I mean, Saka, Burnley's defence was something that's going to be an incredible... In fact, I'll ask it as a quiz question. Can either or any of you three name Burnley's defence on Saturday? Well, I'm cheating because I can see it. So I but can't, I can't how many it. of them did you think were regens? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. So they, they, I mean, poor Vincent Company. They've got some injuries, but that defense is the defense is young. The defense is inexperienced. Three of them have had ten league starts between them. It just looked like one of those games that if you said to Burnley at the start of the game, look, we'll give you a three nil and everyone can just walk home here, they'd have gone, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Thanks very much. Saka just. I mean, he just took the mickey, really. He's so good. Erdegaard had space. He's creating again. Leandro Trossard was actually really inefficient with his chances. Arsenal could have genuinely could have easily scored nine or ten. Mm, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, they do have that head of steam up. They did take the over-celebration accusations personally. They've used that as a siege mentality, siege mentality thing. Their next away game in the league is at Sheffield United, and we should all take abacuses, basically. Oh, you've jinxed it now, haven't you? Burnley... Didn't have a single shot on target. Burnley, as you say, a lot of injuries, a lot of problems for Vincent Company to sort out. Colin Miller making the point, though, that after their incredible season in the Championship, they had a lot of money spent. Over 100 million euros is the calculation that Colin makes. Yeah, well, should, should they be doing a bit better? I mean, are we going to miss anything about Burnley when they go? They're not giving us anything to even... You know, they were playing some nice football at the start of the season, but, but they were getting tanked every week. Mm. Uh, company seems to have, you know, shut them down a little bit. They've regressed to a more defensive, more frugal style. That hasn't worked either. I don't know what they are, really, other than rubbish. Mm. Another injury for them is uh, Aaron Ramsey. And uh, a bit weird to have an Arsenal story about them going away and Aaron Ramsey picking up an injury again. Uh, throwback. But their best wishes to him. Stretch it off and not looking in a good way. Arsenal... Will be in action on Wednesday nights in the Champions League. Champions League knockout football for, for the first time in a very long time. They're going to be away at the Dragao. Did you want to say that for us, JJ? Where are they going to be? <laughs> I believe it's called the Dragao. That's correct. Yes. Playing Porto. That's exactly how yeah. I would say it. Tough game, that, potentially. We'll be looking ahead to that in Tuesday's European edition of the Totally Football Show, which will actually be out maybe late Monday because we're going to go early on account of the midweek European fixtures and the fact that, who knows, by the time you hear this, a certain FC Bayern could be looking for a new manager. Also to flag up that on Tuesday, full-time Europe, the Athletic Women's Football Podcast, will be with you talking about the Man City Chelsea and the WSL and other stuff too. Magnificent. All right, next up, should we talk about top four? Villa have moved into the top four again. They beat Fulham 2-1 at Craven Cottage while Spurs got beaten by Wolves at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Tim. Mm. I called Wolves sexy earlier. You did. I was very surprised. Well, they've had a leap to likability that I would not have been able to predict and I'm struggling to put my finger on exactly what it is. There's a dash of track suited Gary O'Neill in there. There's certainly a hefty portion of Neto and, and Huang. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? Yeah, and obviously there has been, you know, Cunha in terms of in mm. terms of excitement and blistering counterattacks, you know, those two are two of the best. Also the not having kind of brown knitwear sporting uh, Yulen Lopetegui on the sideline <laughs> for me has lifted the mood a little bit. You prefer the, the track suit of I do. Of Gary. There was something a little bit dour and, and despondent about Wolves. Yeah, and do you know what? That's the thing that, that fans are regularly pointing out, that he basically quit or, you know, it was, there was a part in a ways because mm. he was like, this squad isn't good enough. 
you know, I want to be challenging for Europe, basically. Where are they now? I'm, <laughs> yeah, exactly, because I'm Julian Lopetegui, and that's what I want to do. So he, he was in a huff about the players they had to sell and the squad that was left, and Gary O'Neill obviously wasn't going to turn his nose up at that and, and take it on the challenge, and he's he's done it brilliantly. And, yeah, they've beaten... He's beaten Postacoglu twice this season. He's beaten Pochettino twice this season. They beat Man City, and he's 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 a very smart tactician. Um, you know, he's not he's not the most sort of charismatic guy when you when you meet him. But it, but in terms of how to prepare his team for a game uh, and not overcomplicate things, he's done it very very well. And he he knew, he knew what he was going to get from Spurs yesterday, and he lined his team up you know pretty perfectly to deal with it. So. Mm. Danny, you were making the point before when we were talking about Liverpool that they were facing a Brentford team who can't defend at home. Uh, equally, Wolves' opponent on Saturday are not in the best of form neither. Uh, Jack Pitt Brook writing in The Athletic, the only good thing about Tottenham's loss to Wolves is it will force everyone to confront something that has been left unsaid for too long. Which I, at that point I'm thinking, wow, what is it? Uh, Wait, it's yeah. The team is not playing well and has not been for some time. Uh, yeah, it, it is an example of why... Postacoglu needs 22 players rather than 11 because mm. he had his two fullbacks out yesterday, Porro and Adogi, who were so central to what Spurs do. It feels like cheating having that many at the same time. <laughs> yeah. So well, Porro and Adogi, they're not just fullbacks. You know, they get they get into the number 10 position a lot mm. of the time. And yesterday, with them both out, you had Emerson Royale and Ben Davis trying to replicate those roles, which for the best will in the world is is not going to happen. And yet, Postacoglu continues to play exactly the same way, no matter which players he's got on the pitch, which is an accurate, you know, a negative accusation being thrown at him at the moment, mm. which is fair enough, I think. Um, but you know, the other players who were behind their previous issues, like Sun and Madison, are back. Form not so much, though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we were painting Richarlison as one of the best strikers yeah. in the league a few weeks ago, but he's he's not the finished article by any means. Mm. So you know, they'll be fine. Um, yep. But I think I think they're going to need another transfer window to really get what he wants. Okay, how is Sun and his finger? Uh, he, I mean, he, he's he's been playing on taped up. He played the mm. day after it was it was dislocated actually. Right. In this, in Talk this, us through this the kitchen incident, based, the dynamic. It was kitchen a... based incident. Right. Uh, this was the day before South Korea's semi final defeat to Jordan in the Asian Cup mm. when they were embarrassed and humiliated and didn't have a shot on target. And yeah, it's 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 transpired that the day before, um, Son and Lee Kang In from PSG were. Had a bit of a dust up, which was involved. Some of the youth players, younger players from the South Korea team, uh, wanted to go and play table tennis mm. as you do, um, but the team meal hadn't quite finished yet. So uh, Lee, I think, was saying, "No, let him go and play ta table tennis." And Son was like, "Well, no, we need to obey the rules of the kitchen." Mm. And a dust up ensued, and Son had his finger broken How? in the incident. How? Uh, well, the the specifics haven't haven't quite come to to light yet. I have some wild um, conjecture. I, I, well, it, it sounds like quite a playground incident. So I, right. I think his finger's been sort of pulled back Yang maybe by, back. by Lee, yeah. allegedly. Uh, and that's that's how he's broken it. That's what I'd have done. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, been a it's been a crazy couple of weeks in, with, uh, 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 around the South Korean team. Obviously, Jürgen Klinsmann's now been sacked for anyone who hasn't seen mm. after less than a year in charge. And um, the statement that came out from the <laughs> Korean FA made me laugh out loud. You know, you normally get the whole, oh, you know, we thank you for your time and, you know, we wish to place on record our thanks to Jürgen. Um, South Korean FA said, Klinsman had failed to display managerial capability and leadership in areas ranging from tactics to personnel management and attitude. Mm. Yeah, see you later, Jürgen. Could be in for the FC Bayern job, perhaps. Yeah. Why Sounds not? Sounds like a good fit. Mm. Excellent. Villa also won at Fulham. 2-1. Two, Two goals from Molly Watkins. He's having a great season. Anything you want to, any little context you want to throw at this one, Daniel? Yes, I do. I want to talk about Pau Torres, who oh. came back into the team and was um, magnificent again. His ability to kind of step up with the ball, step into midfield without it to kind of engage and, and, and you know, engage opponents, but with the ball to step up and play passes into midfield is just an absolute game changer for Villa. He's He he is the difference maker. The last 14 league games he's played, Villa have won 11 and, and lost one and he had been out for a while he'd missed 10 games in all competitions I think and Villa had only won three of those so I think he is basically the difference when he's there they look so much more stable um the midfielders I think it's I think it's that the midfielders don't have to do as much they don't have to drop as deep for the ball they don't have to show as much because he he adds himself as an extra midfielder and just creates space for them 
Um, yeah, they're a completely different team with him there. Also nice to see Tyron Mings back in training over the last few days after his kind of fairly horrible injury. So, yeah, things looking back up for Villa, I think. Excellent. Things looking back up for Nottingham Forest as well. Daniel, you were there at the City Ground on Saturday to see them beating West Ham, who are, if not in crisis, in something very very adjacent to it. Uh, first of all, uh, you called the Tuna win one of their top three performances since promotion. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you, t- you do have to take into uh, consideration the opponent. West Ham were, were wretchedly bad. Um, they started Calvin Phillips, who wasn't fit in midfield, and they started Mikel Antonio, who didn't look fit up front, and that kind of just set the tone for everything else. Um, but Forest were magnificent. I'd rank it alongside. They beat Villa 2-0 home earlier this season, and they beat Arsenal and Liverpool at home last season. I'd, I'd put it up there with those for complete performances. Um, they should have scored four or five. They missed a load of chances, but they were in control of the game, which hasn't happened a lot recently. It was a kind of must-win because they've now got... Villa away, Liverpool at home and Brighton away. And obviously they didn't know the Luton result at that point. They don't know the result from Everton Palace on Monday night. It is getting a bit sweaty down there. So, uh, yeah, that being said, it was it was their performance of the season. Shout out to Nico Williams, who mm. shut down Mohamed Kudus so, so well. That's as, that's as well as I've seen him play for, for Forest or for Wales. He was magnificent. Um, and they also, they, they, so they picked Felipe old, gnarly Brazilian central defender alongside Mario, young, showy, fun Brazilian central midfielder, uh, central defender, and also picked Danilo in midfield, who is, again, a Brazilian central midfielder. And everything looked to be running much more smoothly than there. And I just wondered if it was just a, simply a language issue. Forrest have got lots of players in that squad who tend to chop and change. Nuno's already said, I won't know my best team until the end of the season. So maybe just having that kind of ease of communication in there. They look so much better for it. I'm wary of saying this, that they would then go and play three really good teams, having played West Ham, who, as I say, were were dreadful. And mm. there were Moyes out banners in the stands. Re- I don't know if you saw it, but there's a really good post-match interview with Moyes where he was like, yeah, they can say what they want and that's fine, but they've had other managers before and the thing about them is I'm, I am I win more than them. Yeah, maybe and another manager, thought, I- Maybe another manager might excite them more, but the one sitting here wins more. Yeah, which is, is, you know what, it's fine, but yeah, but they are sort of, they haven't won in 2024. So there is a sort of element as if say, well, yeah, but maybe, maybe we'd like to win now, David. Look, he, he, I understand both sides of this very kind of diverse argument that we won a trophy with him. That was the best night of our West Ham supporting lives for a long time. Completely get that. But they were the worst away team I've seen at the city ground. And I would cover a couple of championship seasons in that. They were absolutely dreadful. They they off, they offered nothing defensively or going forward. Right. They were also in, down to ten men after Calvin Phillips got uh, sent off. Yeah, he. I mean, he he looks slow. He looks really, really slow. Mm. Uh, he looks so rusty. They've only got him on loan, so you now have to decide whether to keep him in the team and get him back up to fitness, match fitness, or kind of sack this one off already because he was just. Morgan Gibbs White was on his own against Alvarez and Phillips, and Phillips only made one tackle in the whole game. And Forrest had all the ball, and he's in that team to break up play and make tackles. He he was just nowhere. He was late to everything, including the tackle that got him sent off. Yeah. Is it too early to put Phillips in with the great bad loan signings of Kim Calstrom? This, this is what I was googling this morning. Oh yeah. Well, 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 yeah. After after watching the game, I thought, oh, who's who's the worst? I can think of some Wolves ones, but they're quite obscure. Um, but Danny, yeah, Danny Drinkwater's name's been trending on the back of this. Kim Kalstrom. Kim Kalstrom, and yeah, I, I think I thought of, yeah. Falcao's up there because he had, mm. he had two, of course. So he mm. scored four in twenty nine for Man United and one in twelve for Chelsea. But his he had that horrible injury for United, didn't he? That's what kind of yeah, ruined him. But he was still pretty bad. Pato at Chelsea was quite bad as well. Yeah, Pato. Mm. Pato went to Chelsea. Oh my god, I there you go. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right, well, yes, uh, issues for West Ham. Hey, the real question perhaps about all of this, Daniel, is why have Nottingham Forest signed Mark Clattenburg to tell them about refereeing decisions? Yeah, I, I, I can't answer that. Uh, I don't particularly <laughs> want to. I've got have, no idea. Have, I mean, have they really, or is this a kind of informal ad hoc thing that they might call him up on a Monday? Or has he actually well, been brought... Because the way he's been described, he's been installed at Forest as, as the man mm. who's going to essentially, I imagine, be a kind of back, back-channeled back conduit to the, 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 the you know shadowy VAR masters under the volcano. 
I, I don't know what it is, and this is this is pure conjecture, but I think it was Mike Dean who, on Sky Sports News, sort of let it slip. And I wonder if he'd just had a chat with Mark Plattenberg and it had come up and he found this out. And therefore, Forrest were asked about it because it had been said, and they said, yeah, this is happening. So it was it was it is a news story, and it is a legitimate news story. It's, it's, incre- it's fascinating, for my money, for all the wrong reasons. But I, I don't know, is the honest answer. I mean, I, I, I suspect... It's to save on postage for all these letters to PGMOL. There's no point sending them if you ask, can ring Mark three minutes, probably. You can ring Mark Clattenberg and he can say, yeah, they got this one right. Um, but what, they what didn't get the penalty right. It no, they didn't. Said. No, no I've, got, I've, I've got no idea. I, 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 I do not understand it whatsoever and I do not want to even pretend. It's one of those things that, as a Forest supporter, I'm, I'm choosing not to engage with in any way because I don't think it's particularly helpful. Um if it makes and someone feel better, that's that's great. But Forrest will carry on doing what they're doing, I'm sure, and um, the players will concentrate on on playing. It's yeah, it's it's, it's mad to me. But anyway, um, mm. they it didn't start off well because um, they didn't get the penalty they wanted on Saturday, and I think it was a penalty. I think it was as much of a penalty as the, the Newcastle one last weekend. It was a really odd decision, but I'm just glad that you know, on a personal note as a supporter, that finally they made it not matter because um, so much focus they've had on refereeing decisions this season has distracted, I think, from the fact they defended really poorly and they defended magnificently on Saturday. And that is, that's the thing to cling to here. OK. Adam Murray summed up the uh, Klassenberg thing by, in the best way I saw by saying, Klassenberg now holds the most ludicrous combination of jobs in the history of employment. Because for people who don't know, he's also the gladiators referee. Is he? Mm. You Sorry, are yeah. my first whistle. I've never seen Gladiators. Oh, so no. Jimbo, you're missing yeah. out. So they have a ref on that. Yeah, I always wondered how you get qualified for that. Like, where do you, how do you become a Gladiators referee? Do you know, because right, you referee a Champions League final, and you're good to go. Seems like an awful long way to get to to stop Wolf. I'm just thinking about poor Clattenburg's tattoos now, because I mean, if he's going to have to have a Gladiators one and a Forest one. It's going to get busy on that arm. Certainly is. Uh, very good. One other game to tell you about from this weekend, and that was the fairly mad Newcastle Bournemouth affair, which ended 2 2 after a 90 second minute equaliser from the former Cherry hero, Matt Ritchie. Now, of course, turning out for Newcastle occasionally. It's scoring indeed here its first goal in four years. He celebrated properly as he well. He did. Mm. Yeah. Good for him. I agree. Mm. It's good. Is that it for Newcastle's Euro ambitions? Uh, I mean, I don't know. There's lots, lots of things that can happen. What, they're 37 points, 10 points off fifth. I think they probably accept that this year was always going to be more difficult having the sudden change to having Champions League football mm. and Premier League football with the squad they're still trying to really quickly make better. Um, so I, I don't think they'll find it hugely disappointing if they manage to get into the Europa League at the end of the season. That would be probably the aim now. Because it's the top five this year, isn't it? Or something close to it. Well, probably. no, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. The top two teams with you, there's a UEFA coefficient based on teams' results and it's kind of ongoing. It's a rolling. Yeah. So, yeah, so basically this is the ongoing question about which two nations will get a fifth side mm. in the Champions League with its new rebooted format. And this is done on a coefficient based on clubs' performance round by round in the Champions League, Europa and Europa Conference League. At present, Tim, the table shows... Yeah, so it's purely based on this season, because of course some of them go for a few years in a row, but purely based on this season, Italy are top, uh, Germany second and England third. How far are England back from Germany? 286 points. Really? Is that a lot? Just you know. Uh, well, they're on <laughs> England are on 13,500. Oh, OK, yeah. So, no. Yeah, and... Bayern are struggling. We'll see what happens in the return leg with, with Lazio. But I think the, the, the idea, the expectation is that, yes, it could well be England in the top two because English clubs do tend to do well. There's five teams in the Europa League. Yeah, you, you five British sides, Liverpool, at least. Brighton and Villa already yeah. sort of through to the next phase of the Europa yeah. League already. You, you think England's City a good looking chance. good. Mm. Yeah. Arsenal potentially too. So, yeah, quite possibly it could be top five. Could be. Yeah. I mean... That's going to take such, such a... I mean, there's a whole kind of era of top four talk that's essentially exactly. gone. It's the big five now. Big five. Yeah. Anyway, we were talking about Newcastle Bournemouth. Any anything you'd like to say about this game? I noticed um I noticed that uh, that Johnny Lou tweet I told you about earlier mm. where um, he pointed out that uh, Eddie Howe's supposedly defensively strong Newcastle are conceding and scoring at a much higher rate than Kevin Keegan's entertainers back in the nineties. 
because they are conceding a lot and a lot of chances. So their expected goals against is, um, what's it, 44.3. Uh, 44 They've conceded uh, 41 goals. So they're actually uh, overperforming, which is quite quite good for them. But uh, their defensive strength last year was what made them good. Yeah. And they don't, they don't have it this year. And whether that's because they've struggled to maintain the intensity of the press, having to play, you know, you only get... You get two days less training or something every single week. So, and because of the Champions jealous. League. Well, yeah, because you're you're playing midweek and then. But they haven't weekend. been playing that since December. No, I know, but then that's they dropped points early in the season, didn't they? Right. So they were sort of. Well, they, they, here they are drawing at home to Bournemouth. But Bournemouth are good though, and Raiola's got them playing really well. With right. The, they press very well as so well. You're shifting the goalposts a little bit. Well, There's I like to stay on the fence <laughs> okay. at all times. Nice. <laughs> to make nice. myself safe from all angles. Anyway, well done, Bournemouth. Although they still haven't won since Boxing Day in the league, and they've got. City next weekend. On Bournemouth, James, they've, mm. they've drawn three games 2-2 in the league this season and in all three of them they've conceded a 91st or 92nd minute equaliser. Ouch. They, they are really good, but they could be better. They, they're, they're really bad with the lead, um, which I think is probably a... JJ will know more than me, but I think that's probably just a byproduct of Iriola's football, that it kind of it works really well when the game's open and then they kind of don't really know what to do when they've got the lead and they don't need to be as expansive. They've, they've taken like 1.6, I think, points per game this season when they scored first, which is, I think, only Burnley and Sheffield United are worse. There's only two teams worse than them anyway. But if they'd have even been average at doing that, they'd be like eighth in the league, Bournemouth. They're really, really good. Uh, given that I think they what they lost their first six league games of the season, didn't they? It's been a, an incredible turnaround since. They're not perfect, which makes them really good to watch. But yeah, if they work out over the summer, or if Iriola works out over the summer, how to kind of manage those situations in which they can control the game, a bit like we said about Manchester United, um, they will be all the better for it. OK. Are Man United going to be all the better for having Dan Ashworth if they do manage to land him as sporting director from Newcastle? Is that a name that people should be excited about? Is uh, he a transfer guru? Well, I mean, he's shaped clubs and made them very good, right? So, mm. I mean, Newcastle don't want to lose him. Um, did very well at Brighton. Uh, putting everything in place that's got them to kind of where they are. And of course, he was part of the England DNA thing, wasn't he? Was he not instrumental in that? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, if United are going, well, they are going for him, uh, he's meant to be the best of the best, so you want to try and get that in, and it should make them be a, a very sensible, structured club. That he, he would make them a lot better as an entire club, yeah. Excellent. The only, the only thing to say is that at both Newcastle and certainly at Brighton, the whole structure of the club was built so he could excel in his job. And I'm sure it wasn't just him making the calls or you know, doing the scouting on some of those Brighton signings, who, who were all, almost to a man, were fabulous. But it, what Manchester United can't fall in the trap of is what other clubs have done, which is just appointing someone and thinking, well, now we've sorted it, this is all we need, we just needed Dan Ashworth. Like You've got to appoint Dan Ashworth and create a working environment for Dan Ashworth to fly. Because if you don't, then all you do is just end up annoying him and it doesn't it doesn't work. And United have slightly fallen into the trap of that before. It sounds like under Radcliffe they are gonna change that structure and try and do it very, very quickly. Um which yeah, I mean it sounds like Ashworth is up for it. He's a pretty smart bloke, so if he's up for it, he clearly believes in it. All right. Adios Banter is. There you go. The final game of match day twenty five. Sees Everton hosting Crystal Palace on Monday night. Seven games without a win in the League Four. Everton and Palace have only had one win in seven matches. They've had four defeats in their last five. And both teams are lingering uh, dangerously, dangerously close to the bottom three. Palace arguably with the most dramatic a week of all. Uh, Thursday, news first of all leaked that the club had agreed terms with a new manager, the Austrian Oliver Glasner, the former Frankfurt boss, uh, Europa League winner at Rangers' expense a few seasons back. But then that same day, the current Palace manager, Roy Hodgson, was taken ill at training, taken to hospital where his condition was most recently been reported as stable. There was some word on Sunday afternoon that Roy had actually been released, but apparently he's doing much better, which is great news. But to tell us about the position that Palace face, we're joined now by Ruben Pinder of The Athletic and a Crystal Palace fan. Ruben, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, how's Roy doing? Well, thankfully, um, the club were able to confirm uh, that he's stable and was un undergoing tests. Um, that was their last update last week. So, um, And, of, of course, Ray Lewington told reporters um, as he left the training ground that, that he was 
okay so um so that's all obviously a very positive thing to hear um mm. for not just palace fans but football fans yeah is ray going to be in charge on monday then well it's it's not yet clear who will um who will be in the dugout it's possible that it would be paddy mccarthy um another one of roy's assistants who of course captained the club um about sort of 12 years ago so um we'll we'll still have to wait and see for that maybe by the time this comes out we'll know more Okay. What is Palace's thinking uh, through all of this in which they found themselves in the position of having this hugely respected figure uh, seriously unwell enough to be in hospital, but at the same time that they've just lined up his replacement? Yeah, it's a, it's an awkward one. It's quite uncomfortable, isn't it? I mean, I suppose part of the problem is that um, by bringing Hodgson back at the end of last season, uh, which wasn't that unpopular a decision at the time, given how stale and quite, you know, um, and poor the form had got under Vieira. To bring him back, that was quite a popular decision. To keep him there in the summer was less popular um, because, of course, it, it hints at a slight lack of ambition or, you know, that as, as the fans have shown with those banners in the last three games, that is part of the frustration. And then for the form at the back end of last season after his temporary return, to see how we've played this season and the results and just kind of everything beyond a downward graph. Um, that is the frustrating thing that injuries don't help. Um, how much of those injuries, like what proportion of the blame you can, you can kind of put on the coaches is, is very difficult for, you know, those of us who aren't doctors to judge really. But um, so that is a very frustrating thing. And of course, nobody wants to be in a job where everybody's speculating about, your future that publicly um and you know it uh, i said i was going to say it's easy to forget but he is 76 years old um so it you know it, it it's it's become quite a an awkward situation for the club in that in that respect because most people would have hoped like the, the fan base have such a huge amount of respect for for roy hodgson for, for his career and what he did for us in both spells in charge that nobody really wanted it to come to this um obviously nobody wanted him to to fall ill but nobody wanted a really toxic ending. We, we were all quite hoping for a, a nice amicable parting of ways, which um, now becomes quite difficult when, when this has happened. Mm. But Thursday, the club had essentially reached an agreement with Oliver Glasner before Roy was taken ill. Why Glasner? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult one because I think there, there was hope that Kieran McKenna, um, who's doing well with Ipswich, was would be um, an option but obviously if he wants to take Ipswich up and then they do come up and maybe he stays with them or other clubs um, you know like your West Ham's like if they, if they become interested then that becomes a more difficult hire to make so it, it kind of reminds me of when when the club appointed Vieira it's probably not first choice but I suppose right now he is one of the few managers who is available you know along with kind of Cooper and, and Potter and, and Steve Cooper has been linked with the job a lot as well. And there there have been times where it, the, the consensus has been that he seems like the inevitable appointment. But, you know, things change very quickly. Um, and, of course, Glasner has, has some impressive achievements on his CV. So um, from a footballing point of view, I'd be very intrigued to see how he changes the team. Um, and I suppose there's also the, the factor of a slight maybe naivety from the club's point of view that we would coast to survival under, under Hodgson. Um, because with the injuries that we have, the lack of depth beyond what is a good starting eleven when everybody's fit, mm. and 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 the fact that the three promoted teams are you know on paper quite weak this season, and I think there's an assumption that they would go down. I don't think Palace are too good to go down, and maybe that has um, been part of the delay. But when it comes to why Glasner, I mean Dougie Friedman probably must have seen must see something really positive and, and exciting in him. Um, I, I'm not an expert, but if, he, if he's won a Europa League with, with Eintracht Frankfurt, then that's good enough for me. Mm. And it's a question of when, not if, he comes in now. Yes, it does seem that way. Um, it, all the reports are indicating that it will be it will be him. And I suppose, obviously, the, 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 the sad news about Roy's um, illness at the moment has complicated uh, how the club go about doing that. And you know, optics-wise, I'd imagine Rory's departure will be framed as a, a, a mutual parting of ways rather than a sacking. Mm. Excellent stuff. Ruben, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Cheers. Ruben Pinder. Well, best wishes to Roy. His extraordinary career, we thought had come to an end before he came back out, helped Palace out on that, but it, uh, this, might be the, um, this might be where it all, where he 
Finally, hangs up his whiteboard. Manager. Yes, but uh, but yeah, what a what a figure. So good that uh, he's doing better. And uh, yeah, I mean Palace, they didn't want it to be this way. And uh, hopefully, as as Ruben was saying, it'll be a nice kind of consensual time for Roy to step back. And here's the new fellow. Yeah, it feel, it feels like change is inevitable when you've got fan protest for, for weeks on end something's got to give and you know the chairman's not going to sack himself and the players are going nowhere so unfortunately it falls on Mr Hodgson yeah I, I think it was a bit of a strange one that he elected to continue for this season to be honest mm. last season sort of felt like the perfect time to bow out mm. he kept them up in style if you remember some of the results that they produced no Goals one was expecting lot. that mm. he sort of changed his reputation a bit towards the end and everyone was sort of very happy for him and then I think as he said himself earlier in the season you know Everyone's got an ego, himself included, and that's sort of what's sort of tempted him back to for more of the same. But I don't know. I don't know what he wanted to achieve this season, other than keeping Palace up again. What was the objective for him to keep going? Be out of the house, there? I think, was a strong <laughs> well, motivation. Yeah, good reason as any. Well, there you go. They're taking on Everton on Monday night. Everton, who are in the bottom three, but they are only five points behind Palace. So an Everton win would make things a little bit too interesting down there for the Eagles. That's where we'll park things, I think, for today. There's a new Totally Out late Monday, as mentioned previously. For now, though, many, many thanks to Daniel. I look forward to reading your thoughts on the Premier League weekend in the score on the eye, or in the eye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, James. Tim, what have you got cooking for us at The Athletic? Very little. Good. Nice. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be good, whatever it is. And JJ, any short-form video content? Oh, loads. I make lots of them. There'll be probably three next week. Really? Yeah. So we just churn them out. Okay. Just find an angle, lock it down to a short script. Boom. And then fire that out. Nice. Internet gold. All right. Yeah. Where do we find those? The internet. Uh, yes. <laughs> the Athletic FC on, on the YouTube and TikTok. Very good. This I don't know what you're up to, but I'm sure it's going to be great and you'll be brilliant. Thank you so much for being a part of today's show and we look forward to your company whenever you're available perhaps on Monday stroke Tuesday for that Euro show for now though from all of us here it's goodbye the Totally Football Show podcast is available three times a week bringing you all the football news you could reasonably be expected to care about we've got views we've got stats we've got analysis we've got some of the best football writers around and the whole thing is absolutely free so have a listen on spotify or apple podcasts or all the usual places by clicking on the link below